Hey everybody, how's everybody doing tonight? We're going to get and get it kicked off, all right folks? So, uh thank you very much everybody. Uh, we uploaded we've been uploading more and more videos. Can you shoot me a message and let me know if you've had an opportunity? I know a few of you missed the last few sessions. Um we've got all of the last few sessions online already. Just want to make sure and see who's had the opportunity to look at them and who hasn't. Okay, great. Some of you have, some of you haven't. Well, we got them loaded up, and as we discussed last week or the week before, I think I sent it by email, um, they're listed by module, okay? So they'll be listed as the field safety book, and then it'll be listed by the module or the modules that we covered that week. So let's go ahead and get it started for tonight, all right, folks? We're starting on module nine. We're wrapping up this book tonight, okay? So we're wrapping up the field safety book tonight. Any questions so far, anybody that's online? Um, you know, I, I know some people have been... Uh, been able to make some sessions others you haven't been able to anybody get any questions so far are y'all okay okay good okay well let's go ahead and get it cranked out folks okay so uh we're talking we're at uh section section one module nine now and we're talking about hazards uh, material handling okay uh hazards related to material handling and safety procedures so you know basically what are we talking about right we're talking about basically manipulating loads is what we're talking about and in order to reduce at risk or injuries uh, whenever we're manually moving material, we went ahead. We went ahead and, and plan out and make our task right, so that we can assure that we approach that load properly. Uh, make sure that we wear whatever PPE necessary and practice safe lifting practices as well. Things that we want to do, we always want to assess the situation before we do any attempt to lift. Right, we want to make sure that we that we go ahead and do the following. We want to check to make sure that the load's not too big, it's not too heavy, and in addition to that, that it's not too hard to grasp. So it could be too big, too heavy, or it could be an awkward uh, load as well, or maybe it doesn't have adequate space for us to put our hands or safely put, put our hands. Also, making sure that the load doesn't have any type of protruding wires, nails, sharp edges. I think a perfect example of this is, uh, is like uh, two by fours of material after we start to demo certain things on a project. I think this is where we usually wind up having the greatest risk, either on a demo process or also in addition to a demo process, uh, also can be uh, in the process of when we start, also when we start doing the work as well. So because if uh, we had previous materials and if we didn't adequately uh, uh, remove the nails prior to, then now we may, we may be coming in and we may not be aware where the, where the nails or any protruding edges are. Also making sure that the material um, is something that, that we're able to lift by ourselves. If not, what are we looking for? We're looking for assistance or we're looking to maybe get something automated like a fork truck, right? A dolly or something that's either manually powered or uh, self-propelled, one of the two. And then, of course, inspecting our path of travel, especially early in the morning, folks, right? Early in the morning, late in the evenings when uh, visibility may not be ideal uh, is definitely we want to make sure that we uh, give it a little bit more attention. And um, why? Because it can be, you know, it can be a cause for slip trips and falls, in addition to that, uh, we may have to be uh, to go around a certain path, right? So uh, maybe walking the path, especially if it's something that we may have a partially obstructed view or maybe have to have a need for a spotter. And then also, we want to always read any warning labels, instructions on any type of materials before we move them. We never know when uh, us moving any type of material may cause harm to the material itself, then in fact, maybe causing harm to us as well. Okay, or it may tell us a safe, safer and a, and a better way to lift it as well, or to approach the load. And then, um, and then things that we want to remember, right? Certain guidelines, safety guidelines. Don't wear any loose clothing, right? They can get caught in any type of moving parts, especially if we're talking about anything that's working around, let's say, uh, any type of rigging equipment or lift equipment. Also, making sure that our button sleeves uh, are... We button our sleeves, also tucking any shirt tails, removing any type of jewelry and rings, also tying back and securing any type of long hair underneath our hard hat, and um, and just making sure that, that we keep any type of jewelry like wrist watches or anything, anything that can easily get caught or break away, we want to keep that out of, out of harm's way as well. And um, and then of course wearing gloves, right? And and it's not just wearing gloves, folks. It's wearing it's wearing the proper gloves also. Let me let me ask you, uh, anyone out there, have you ever noticed? And I think we talked about this way back when, and in, in the first book, in the safety orientation book. Anybody ever notice when sometimes you have employees and they're wearing the wrong type of gloves? 
Um, I've had obviously some instances where employees are wearing um, nitro gloves to do work, construction work. So, you know, items like that where we want to make sure that we're definitely being cautious of. Okay. So, uh, so just, just keep that in mind as well. Okay. So right glove for the right job, right? Just like the right tool for the right job. And then in addition to that also, in, in some cases also, we may be pulling those gloves off. Anytime we're working around rotating equipment or high speed rotating equipment or high talk equipment, uh, we may need to remove those gloves as well. So let me ask you folks, who's familiar with, and I'm going to give you an example of that right now, not in lifting, but in actually machine guarding. Who's familiar with a, with a rigid 535 pipe threading machine? Let me know if you're or if you're familiar with the pipe threading machine or if you're not. And I know some of you um, um, are on your mobile device, and I know it's not easy to, to check back and go back and forth, so don't worry about it, right? Don't worry about putting in anything into the chat unless you actually can without without disrupting your uh, whatever, whatever your process is on your side, okay? Okay, so let me go ahead and pull up and, and show you folks what uh, – what a pipe threading machine, a 535 pipe threading machine looks like. And I also want to show you how sometimes um, even the manufacturer may, may somewhat contradict themselves. And this is a great piece of equipment. So it's uh, it's a little hard to, to, to watch this, but give me one second. We're going to pull it up right now. I think some of you who chimed in know, you've probably seen it, but you probably just didn't realize what it was. So here you go, folks. You've probably seen it at Home Depot. You've probably seen them at Lowe's. You see them on the job site a lot and piping. Now now who's familiar with the 535? You see anybody seen these on the work site before? Okay, yeah, big difference, right? You know, so anytime you hear somebody talking about the 535, that's what they're talking about. Let me bring you to the PDF on this 535. And um, and I want to show you something really quickly, okay? Okay, so this is this is the manual, folks. Uh, excuse me. Let's see. Okay, so this is the manual for the 535 pipe threading machine, and I'm gonna do Control F, okay, because I, I, I work with this uh, with this pipe thread a good bit in the past. So here you go. I'm searching the word gloves, and look what it says. And 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 let's see how this kind of contradicts itself from time to time, right? So dress properly, right? Don't wear any loose clothing or jewelry, long hair. Uh, keep your hair and clothing and gloves away from the moving parts, right? Okay. We're going to go through all five. If you notice up here, there's five matches for gloves, okay? And then look at the second one, right? Specific safety information now. You know, loss of fingers, hands and arms and other body parts. You know, if clothing or jewelry could carton any type of moving parts. Okay, now look. Clothing. Gloves, right? And gloves can get caught in moving parts, kind of what they just told us. Look at the next line. Look at look at look at the fourth reference here. Do not wear gloves. Okay. And then the last one, again, do not wear gloves or loose or loose clothing. So whenever anybody ever seen somebody operate this pipe threading machine before while it's in operation? Yeah, watch them, watch them the next time, okay? And, and the reason I bring this up is because we're so used to having every tool, right, uh, or every machine that we use and tool that we use a glove with, that what's happening now, I think a lot of times, is that we're overburdening our own safety programs. And this is a perfect example. First of all, they mentioned gloves. They mentioned gloves in, th in the first three uh, sightings of, of the word gloves in this document. And then the next two basically tell us, don't wear the gloves. OK, so just just be cautious of it. OK. And, and the problem is, is, you know, I've talked to plumbers. This is a really, really um, th this is a, a catch 22 for for people who do piping and threading. And the reason being is because they're obviously threading pipe. So they're they're working around sharp objects and you have a lot of spurs and, and a lot of splinters of, uh, of metal shavings, let's say. OK, but at the same time, we have to ha we also take a significant risk of somebody's hand getting caught into the 535 machine. OK, so 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 uh, hand placement, hand placement is extremely, extremely critical. OK, and this is for anybody who hasn't seen this work before. This is called the low torque, uh, excuse me, low speed, high torque machine, which means it's got a lot of power. It just rolls very slowly. OK. All right. So um, let me see. I thought for some reason. 
let me see if it gives us the RPM on it. I thought it did, but no. I think it's on the actual machine itself. Yeah, I think it's on. I think it's on the machine itself. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think you have to look on the pipe threader. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so, you know, obviously, you know, hazards we want to be cautious of, right? Uh, often lifting, but I, want, I did want to throw that in for the power tools um, because you're talking about getting them caught and jewelry getting caught. Okay, so prop, proper lifting procedures, 1.1.0. Um, things that possibly, right? Asking uh, coworkers for assistance if necessary, right? If the load's too heavy. Basically, if it weighs more than 50 pounds is when we shouldn't carry it alone. Let me show you where this is, folks. With the OSHA, it's not in the OSHA standards. It's actually in the OSHA e-tool. So it kind of falls under the general duty clause, right? So let's say OSHA 50 pounds, lifting. And right here, if you notice right here, we're in the OSHA e-tool. You see it right here? We're in the OSHA e-tool, right? And then there you go. Lifting loads and heavier than 50 pounds can cause a serious risk of injury. So this is where our 50-pound standard comes from. It's not even a standard. It's really it's a, um, it's, a, it's, it's a recommendation by OSHA, but it could be considered a general duty clause if, uh, if anybody gets uh, injured from that, okay? Let's see if it shows it again. Uh, there's your weight limit, right? You lift no more than 50 pounds. When lifting a load heavier than 50 pounds, what are we going to do? Two or more people, right, to lift the load. Okay, so everybody see where I found it? I just basically went to OSHA, right? I mean, excuse me, to Google. There you go. I just Googled OSHA 50 pounds lifting, and it was the first thing that came up. Okay, and then I did my Control F or my Command F, depending on what type of uh, computer program you're on, and I just did my word search for the number 50. Okay. All right, good deal. So let's go ahead and move on. Also, another another hazard, right, is handling objects uh, longer than 10 feet. So we want to be cautious of um, of manipulating loads that are too long because we do start to lose that center of gravity on them. And then and then the wind may also possibly take them as well. And then handling objects that can be, that can be affected uh, by wind gusts, uh, like plywood or sheets of rigid insulation as well. Also louvers. Let me let me show you like chiller louvers, and I think I showed you this a while before. Let's say um, let's say uh, here you go. I'm talking about louvers like this, folks. Like on, like on big chilling systems like this. You know, a lot of times you pick up these pieces that they'll be uh, 12, 16 feet long. They're aluminum. They're very lightweight, and the wind will take them as well. Okay. So um, basically when they come apart, so a lot of them, some of them come apart in panels like these do here. Some of them will be long slats and will be uh, cooling towers, I think is where it is. Let's see. Okay. And then um, you'll wind up having uh, long slats like this right here when employees move them. Okay. So just to kind of give you an idea as well. So it's not always the weight. It's not always the length, but sometimes it may also be whether the wind catches it or or if uh, anything that's going to work against us, okay? And then uh, if you notice right up, up right above in the illustration, of course, it's talking about adequate and proper uh, bending, right? So bending at the knees, not at the back. Uh, twisting at the feet, they don't show it, but twisting at the feet as, as opposed to twisting at the, at the knees or at the back, okay? So actually t turning at our feet as opposed to our waist, okay? So just items like that that we want to keep in mind, right? And then also remember this, right? And I'm, I'm on page three uh, on the upper left. You know, before we attempt to lower loads, right, overhead loads, we do have to make certain considerations as well. We want to size that load up. If it looks too heavy, right, we, we may have to have more than one person lift it, okay? In addition to that, it's probably too heavy. So if it looks too heavy, it may be too heavy, right? Just things we want to keep in mind. And then let's ask ourselves as well, you know, how did it get up here? right? Was it put up there with a lift truck? Was it put up there with some type of hoist? Was it more than one person to put it in place? Where can I possibly put my hands? Where is the greatest risk of my hands being caught or injured? So just different questions like that that we always want to ask, right? What if, basically? What if, what if case scenarios? And then also lowering objects down uh, the same way you would, uh, you would straight back, right? So um, if we have to place it to one side or another, and then we move our feet instead of twisting out our body like I was just talking about as well. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about working with cables as well. 1.1.3. And items that we want to keep in mind, right? We want to read and understand both the operating and safety instructions, right? For any type of pull system before we pull cable. So uh, just remember, when whenever we pull in cable, maybe manually pulling it and we also may be reeling it in so you know always want to be cautious right whether it's manual pulling or or mechanical pulling um, also when moving reels of cable we want to avoid any type of back strains right we want to use proper lifting techniques um, at all times we um, like we just finished discussing also uh, when manually pulling wire we want to spread our legs to maintain that that balance of gravity right we don't want to overstretch we want to stretch but we don't want to overstretch and then also we want to select a rope that has a pull-in load rating, right, greater than the estimated forces that we're going to use. I'll give you a perfect example. Is you got to be real, real careful with polyester rope or manila rope. And that's what I'm talking about. Certain polyester ropes, especially uh, um, inexpensive. Let's see. Let me, let me use manila rope. You know, manila ropes, right? Like fiber ropes like this. It, it also could be uh, poly, uh, poly fiber uh, ropes as well. So we want to always be cautious of these of these type of ropes because uh, obviously a lot of times it's going to be related to, to price, right? So price is going to be almost be directly uh, related to, uh, to the quality control that we're getting. So what we want to do is we want to go ahead and know that force, okay? What kind of rating that rope has. To make sure that we're not, it's going to pop on us and then all of a sudden we're going to fall back. We're going to harm ourselves. We're going to cause damage to equipment or possibly harm somebody else, okay? In addition to that, we also want to um, only use low stretch rope. Like multi, like multiply ropes, double braided polyester uh, ropes as well. Uh, and they're for cable pulling, right? So, uh, So let's see. So that's what we're talking about, right? So uh, different ropes that are used for actual cable pulling, because they'll have that sheer strength. They'll have that sheer strength or that that strength, so that it doesn't uh, easily pop for us. Okay. So just want to keep that in mind, all right? And then, um, in addition to that, we want to inspect that rope before we use it. Always, we want to make sure that there's no cuts, no frays, right? No significant damage to it that may uh, cause it to pop or uh, or fray. Um, in addition to that, also uh, when designing the pull. We want to keep the rope confined in the conduit wherever possible. So it's easy, it's better and obviously safe for, to keep it in, in the conduit and hopefully make sure that we have no sharp edges or, round, or, uh, or, or tight corners where it may possibly damage that rope as well when we're doing the pull. And then, of course, we don't want to damage our wiring either. And then we also, if the rope has, uh, for any reason, if the rope breaks, okay, and 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 uh, any other type of the system fails, what happens? We're going to have some type of stored energy, right? We may have whipping under the rope. We may have people falling back, kind of like what we were just talking about a few moments ago. Also, we want to we want to make sure we wrap up the rope after we use it to prevent anybody tripping on it. And then we also want to remember this, is that for pulling wires, we may need wire grease also, okay? So let's say wire pulling grease. So for anybody for anybody who's not who's not familiar with it, this is what I'm talking about. Have y'all seen this before? Tell me if you've seen it or haven't seen it. It's kind of like a poly gel. They spray it. They spray it in a conduit, and it makes the wire slide in easier. It actually uh, it causes uh, it reduces the resistance or the friction. All the diff for those of you that answered yes, all the difference in the world, right? When they use it. And it's really, it doesn't have a lot of grease in it. It's it's actually, it's a really good product. They sell it in a foam. They sell it in a gel, like a poly gel. Really, really good product, okay? It's 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 amazing the difference on the strain on the person's body, okay? And the difference of the strain that it doesn't put on the wire or the rope as well, okay? So just, just keep it in mind. Um, the funny thing is, you can find it at Home Depot too. So it's, you know, it, you don't always have to go to like some type of electrical supply store. Ideal, as a matter of fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, is the brand that and Klein, those two brands, they also sell it at Home Depot nowadays. Okay. Okay, good. Let's talk a little bit about guidelines for stacking and storing materials. We kind of talked about this in one of the previous chapters uh, last week or the week before, and then we'll kind of we'll kind of just go ahead and wrap this up tonight. 
So things that we want to do, right? Different observations that we want to do and guidelines we want to follow. First of all, keeping aisle and passageways clear clear in the storage area, right? We have to keep on thinking, what if? You know, first of all, for traffic control. Second of all, for employees that uh, not to have slip trips and fall hazards. And then ultimately, and one of the main ones that we want to keep in mind is um, in case of emergency evacuation, we, we don't want uh, items or hazards being in the way, okay? We also want to make sure the materials are stored in cartons, uh, that they should be kept away from any type of rain or moisture so that the, uh, the cartons don't, uh, don't get messed up. Anybody who's not familiar with cardboard boxes, uh, the government actually identifies them as fiberboard. So this is, let me, let me show you. And I, and I actually learned this, uh, I, I actually, uh, fiberboard boxes or containers, I actually learned this in an environmental trainer class that I took. So let's see. So, so the, the government really doesn't recognize for shipping like EPA, DOT, they don't recognize the word cardboard. They actually uh, recognize the word fiberboard. Okay. So there you go. Okay. And then items also, uh, we never want to stack cartons too high, right? Um, uh, we don't, we don't higher, higher than what they tell us. So boxes may tell us, hey, only stack two tall, only stack four tall, only stack six feet high, four feet high, eight feet high. So a lot of times a manufacturer will give us uh, the instructions, and that's going to go back to proprietary standards, folks. Okay, so the manufacturer is telling us what not to exceed or what to do. So therefore, we need to make sure that we stay and we respect that that proprietary standard. Okay. Um, in addition to that, also. We want to stack lumber on level, solid, supported sills, and we have to remember to remove all the nails, right? We want to stack pipes neatly, and we want to and we want to choke them, right, so that they can't roll or chalk them. Excuse me, chalk them so they don't roll. Look at um, look at figure three on your right hand side on page five. That's a perfect example there. They're basically chalking it right or blocking it there, and and it's basically so pipes can't keep on rolling out. And then that way they can start stacking them in pyramids, okay? And, of course, we, we want to taper in every time we do that. We're not going to have an option but to taper in, so that will kind of work out for us anyway, okay? Um, we also want to make sure that we stack pipes and fittings according to size so, you know, so we don't have to dig through them. So if we've got pipes, let's say, that are all 10-inch uh, diameter, put all the 10-inch pipe together, right? You know, 12-inch diameter, put all the 12-inch pipe together. Not only that, but also we want to stack them by length as well. So preferably keep them separated by length, but if we're going to stack them by length, of course, keep them neatly and orderly, and you'll probably have your longer loads, your longer pieces on the bottom. But normally, remember this, we're normally using longer pieces first, so if you have the longer pieces on the bottom, you're often moving a lot of the small, shorter pieces on a more regular basis, okay? So that's why it's almost better to, to stack them separately. And then, of course, like we said, ch uh, chalking all material and equipment, like pipes, drums, tanks, reels, right, trailers, wagons, anything like that, especially if anything's on an incline, uh, chalk it if it's any type of loose materials. And then, of course, if it's any type of vehicle or trailer or anything, if it's not on even ground, and then we want to chalk it as well. If it doesn't have brakes on it, we definitely want to chalk it, okay? And then, of course, tying down or banding down, you know, uh, all light materials, right, that may have a large surface area um, so the wind doesn't move it, okay? And then not uh, don't stack in uh, bag materials, um, the same width all the way to, from the top of the pile to the bottom of the pile. Basically, what we want to do, we want to go ahead and taper in that material, right? Uh, often, or we'll go ahead and block it. If you look at if you look at Figure Four, you'll see properly stacked bags, and, and it's basically called blocking them. And the same thing happens with brick and block. If you notice at Figure Six at the bottom, and basically what it is is we're blocking them. And then in addition to that, we also want to see that we uh, stack in bricks, right? No higher than seven feet tall. And then we're going to taper back the bricks two inches for every foot that we go above four feet. So, so once we get to four feet and we have loose bricks or blocks, now we want to start tapering in. So our pile is going to get smaller as we go to the top, higher than four feet. All right, and we're gonna, and we're going to be we're going to go ahead and start tapering in those two inches for every foot that we go up. Okay, and that's and that's in order to keep that center of gravity and keep it from um, all falling apart. And also, we want to store uh, store flammable materials like gasoline, right, in well ventilated area, away from any type of hazard of ignition. And we also want to make sure it's an approved flammable cabinet, right? So remember this: we want to make sure it's an, an approved flammable cabinet. 
And then I think um, I think some of you remember that we talked about a few weeks ago about gas cans. We want to make sure that those gas cans are in UL rated containers. Okay, that's uh, that's uh, that'll be a really good tip for you guys to remember, especially when we go to, into the test review, um, is keeping those safety cans into an approved uh, UL container. Okay, with a self closing lid. So um, let's go ahead and move on, folks. And we're going to go ahead and move on. We're going to go ahead and move on to. Uh, to page seven, section two. And then obviously, as you see there, right, industry term, you know, center of gravity, which we all know, it's it's the point where it's gonna be most balanced, closest to the ground and to the center. And concrete mule, I'll show you a picture of it in just a moment. You know, fall zone, what is it? You know, whenever we're lifting, right, it's the area, you know, it's a diameter, it's the area having a diameter is twice the height of the object is being lifted. So basically, if, we, if we're picking up an object that's being lifted, let's say, um, you know, it's um, four feet in diameter, and well, then we're looking at eight feet, right, uh, as a, basically as a safety zone, okay? Twice its, twice its diameter, uh, just in case something were to happen. And then, of course, freight elevator. What are we looking at? Freight elevators use to transport materials from floor to floor. We cannot use um, a freight elevator, like on a construction site, we cannot use that for personnel. Just like as if we were in a lift, in a personnel lift, and we're using it for materials only. We cannot use it for personnel unless it's been rated and tested uh, for personnel, okay? So much different from a freight elevator from like a business building or, or a commercial uh, application because those freight elevators, usually somebody rides with the load, but a freight elevator in construction, normally we, stat we keep on piling the materials into the freight elevator and those freight elevators should not be used with uh, persons, okay? It's made to sh ship materials up and down. And then also, um, we're also talking about hand truck, right, which we all know, industrial forklift, which we all know. We talked about the e-tools, and we talked about uh, the operator certification and training already for forklifts. Also, we're talking about jacks, right? We're talking, uh, we'll talk about hydraulic jacks. We'll finish talking about that in just a second. Material carts as well. We'll show you in the next page. Pallet jacks, and then we're going to have manual pallet jacks and motorized pallet jacks. Also, pipe mule. If anyone's not familiar with a pipe mule, I'm going to show it to you. It's in the next two or three pages. And it's, it's basically made where we can put a pipe, usually two, three, four, five, six inch, uh, excuse me, two, three, four, six inch pipe on it. And, um, and we'll move them uh, multiple pieces at one time. You don't really see them that often, to be honest with you. And then, of course, pipe transport, right? Like a, a pipe kind of, kind of looks like a pipe mule. I'll show it to you as well. And then your powered wheelbarrow. Um, Roller skids as well, rough terrain forklifts, skid steers or rough terrain forklifts, using a spotter anytime the load is obstructed as well, a traditional wheelbarrow, manual wheelbarrow, and then and then our work zone as well, right? So if you flip to the next page, and we kind of talked about this last week, so we'll go ahead and kind of push through here. If you if you go to the to the next page, you'll see that um, there's a picture of material cart, right? Perfect example would be Home Depot, Lowe's, or something like that, truck and tractor supply. All right, and then you have your hand truck in figure eight on page nine. Then there's your roller skids. There's your roller skids on page, um, you know, an uh, example of it, figure nine. Your traditional wheelbarrow, figure 10. And there's your, your pipe mule, folks. Uh, if you notice, you see, basically, we're putting that pipe with its center of gravity as much as possible over those wheels to keep it as balanced as possible. And then and then they lay all the pipe inside that little V, uh, that little V uh, ridge and and then balance the material and pull it with the handle, okay? So obviously we're still looking at length and distance, right? But a lot of times if you look at that, if you look at that pipe cart, look at the handle. The handle's not centered. The handle on that particular piece of equipment would be used to somebody to pull basically with their right hand, okay? And since most people are dominant right-handed, that's why most of them are made like that, okay? And then we're, we're going to come back to the bullet points. Let's just go ahead and go through. I want to show you the, the rest of these pieces of equipment, and then we're going to come back to the bullet points, okay? On the next page, on page 10, you can see pipe transport. Like I said, it's a little bit different from the pipe mule, okay? Um, also, jacks or hydraulic jacks that we were talking about there. The biggest thing with the hydraulic jacks, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, is making sure that the fluid's in it, that, that it's got adequate fluid. If not, it will lose pressure. And you also want to make sure that it's hydraulic-rated fluid as well, okay? It's not motor oil. It's actually hydraulic-rated fluid. 
And then there's your pallet jack, a motor, uh, manual pallet jack. If that pallet jack is motorized, that employee must be forklift trained for a type two, for a type uh, type three uh, forklift. Okay, which is a motorized pallet jack. So let me go back to that. I know we talked about that a few days ago. Here you go. There's your there's your seven types. I'm sure you probably remember your seven classes or types of forklifts. Number one is a gas powered right regular sit down forklift. Number two is a narrow aisle. Um, it's a narrow aisle. It can be something you can walk behind. A lot of times I call them walkies. It's any of these right here. You can ride in the cab. You can possibly ride in the cab. Um, you can um, also be in the type of cab where the cab goes up with you, kind of like they have at Home Depot and Lowe's. One that has an, a rigger that the forks push out further out to give it better access. So it could be any of those different lift codes, okay? Um, and like I said, somebody can walk in it or they could walk behind it, okay? Ride in it or walk behind it, okay? So um, so that pallet jack, like I said, if it would have been motorized, it would have been three, but it's manual, so it's not, okay? And then there's your powered wheelbarrow at the bottom. That and the concrete buggies tend to, tend to look a good bit alike. Look at the concrete buggy on the or concrete mule on the next page, okay? They're pretty much, uh, they're pretty similar, okay? And then, of course, your industrial forklifts, you know, obviously, uh, you know, more of a uh, newer type forklift or, or, uh, or um, a different design forklift, okay? All right, so now let's go back and let's, uh, let's go back to page eight. And let's talk about the following safety guidelines that we want to keep in mind, right? We want to use devices that are in good condition. We want to use what's appropriate for the job, uh, for the load that's going to be carried. We want to inspect the device before we use it to ensure that all the moving parts are going to be intact, right? That, that, that stability is there. Also, we want to plan our route again, right? We want to watch for any obstructions in the walkway of the path, see if we're going to have to divert or detour anywhere. Uh, be sure that all items uh, are transported and sturdy enough. Uh, to be able to be moved. We want to also secure any bulky, awkward, or delicate objects as well. Uh, we always want to put the heaviest load at the bottom. That way we help keep the center of gravity, and it makes it easier to handle the load as well, right? Um, we want to stagger boxes. Uh, when we stack them, kind of like the blocking, like we talked about bricks, back on page, um, back on page, I think, four or five, back on page uh, five, just like the cinder blocks or the bags. We want to uh, block them preferably, okay, or wrap them, shrink wrap them, or secure them down somehow, okay? We also want to uh, maintain a safe speed, and we keep the device under control. We want to keep our hands and feet from underneath any type of uh, work-saving devices, like dollies, hand trucks, or anything. And also, we don't want to stack items higher, higher than our line of sight, like we talked about, right? We don't want to obstruct our view, so we want to go ahead and minimize any, any type of risk like that. And then basically from material carts, what are we talking about, right? Anytime we use material carts, this is what we want to keep in mind. Before using the cart with caster wheels, we want to inspect and we want to ensure that all the casters roll and they swivel fully, freely. Let me ask you, anybody out there, have y'all ever, anybody ever gone to Home Depot? All of a sudden you grab that cart, you load it up, maybe you found it in the, in the lumber section, you load it up and all of a sudden you start pushing and your wheels bump in or one of the wheels is off the rim or something. Why do you think it's in the lumber section? Why do you think it wasn't outside in the parking lot with the rest of them? Right? So obviously, you know, even if you find it in the lumber section, just run it around a little bit, right, before you uh, before you load it up and go. All right? All right, great. And then also, anytime we use the cart with, like, pneumatic tires, air pressure tires, same thing, right? We want to make sure that they're in good shape. Um, I'll give you a perfect example of those hand trucks. I much prefer... I know, I know air pressure tires are so much smoother, but I cannot stand grabbing a hand truck with air pressure tires because so many times they're low or they're flat that it's just annoying. So to be honest with you, I prefer to just go straight up to a, uh, in, my, in my preference at least, I prefer to go straight up into just using a, a regular hand truck with solid wheels, one less issue. Okay? But I know it's not always practical and it's definitely not always the most comfortable. 
also checking to make sure that the surface has uh, adequate traction, right? To avoid any subscription falls wherever we're walking, walking or using this uh, hand truck or dolly. We want to also uh, make sure that when, whenever we're moving a cart, that we keep our hands away from any edges or handles on the side, right? To avoid any type of pinch points or, or crushing or pinching our hand or fingers. We want to make sure that the load center, right, and it's secured to, uh, it's secured on the uh, on the truck, the little hand uh, cart material cart, right? Uh, also, if materials are protruding, you know, out in the front, we also want to avoid, we may have to, we'll get a spotter, right? If they're too long, they're where, we, where we're concerned that somebody may possibly get hurt, we may have to get a spotter. And then all, uh, obviously using caution anytime we move our cart on any type of incline or declined surface, right? And we never want to load a cart past its uh, past its what its label capacity is. Okay, a lot of times that's why we'll find the ones with the damaged tires, right? Because people have pushed them past their 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 manageable capacity. Okay, and then if the load's too heavy, um, uh, we uh, on the decline, what's going to happen? It may drag us down with it, right? It may pull us. So just be cautious of that as well. Okay, then of course you know just exercising the same type of safety with hand trucks, right? You know, again, watching your back, watching when you pick up the load to kind of pull it back just to make sure that you're not overexerting yourself. And then roller skids as well, right? Roller skids, a lot of times, what do we do is we move materials, right? But pushing them on the, on the table service, right? And it's going to be uh, placed in, on the top of two or three or four different roller skids, okay? So, uh, so just keep that in mind as well. And then, of course, you know, the pipe mule, right, or traditional wheelbarrow as well. We all know, most of us know that nowadays uh, many wheelbarrows come with two wheels instead of one. Definitely much easier. We don't have to balance it. We're not, it's not as difficult to balance now, and it's a little bit more ergonomically safe for us. And then pipe transport, right, like you see at the bottom. Same thing, trying to keep um, – Trying to keep pipe uh, same length. Uh, if you're gonna have smaller pieces of pipe, try to put them on the top. Um, it's always it may not be a bad idea to kind of either bind bind them or strap them together. Also, is always a good practice. And then you jack on the next on the next page. The biggest thing with a jack, I'll tell you, is you gotta watch it's we gotta respect its weight capacity. The good thing is, a lot of these jacks can hold way more weight than what we anticipate. I'll give you an example. A uh, picture like an illustration uh, for figure thirteen. We often, um, with um, with jacks like that, we often, those things will hold 8, 12, 15, 20 tons, okay? So, you know, of course, you don't want to have put all your trust in one, but, um, but you know, obviously, uh, just, just be careful of it, you know, and I tell people if you're using it on any type of a vehicle or anything, either have a second jack or have a fixed jack, right? And then um, a lot of times you'll notice them when they're when they're shoring. Uh, people who are, don't do not do automated shoring, and if they do manual shoring, you'll tend to see them a good bit too. Okay, but just watch the condition of them. Make sure that the uh, the the little uh, what do you call it? It's almost like a handle and a and a screw at the same time down right smack in the middle of it. If you look at it, and that's where you can raise. That's where you can let out the pressure in order to let the jack go down making sure that it's adequately tightened up so that the pressure, there's no release of pressure, okay? And then, of course, pallet jack, right? What are we talking about? I'm at the bottom of page 10 going into page 11. Pallet jack, pallet truck, whatever you want to call it. And like we said, some of them are hydraulic, some of them will be manual. So, you know, what do we want to do, right? Is regardless, and in this case, we're talking about more of the manual ones than anything else. We want to inspect that pallet jack before we use it. We want to look carefully for any type of malfunctions, any type of missing parts. We also want to check any oils, right, around the fittings or the hoses of any type of uh, hydraulic power jack uh, to make sure that that um, that any leaks before the jack is put in service that we identify them as well and, and hopefully take care of it and correct that, right? Uh, never using a pallet jack to lift or transport a load that exceeds the jack's rated capacity, the same thing. We also want to inspect the wood pallet to ensure that it's in good condition as well. So it's not just inspecting the uh, the jack, but it's also inspecting the pallet often as well. Okay. All right, so um, we're going to keep on moving, folks. So we're going to talk about uh, minimizing the risk when using motorized uh, material handling, okay? 
basically whenever we're lifting materials uh, mechanically, we have to be careful to secure the materials again while we're loading, right? We also have to ensure that, that we're aware of any type of obstructions, uh, maybe people may be in the way or in harm's way, equipment, materials. We want to make sure that we keep maintain a clean path or that clear path. Basically, just about all the same safety precautions, if not more, than from a manual operation, right? And anytime we're handling materials with a machine, like a pallet jack or forklifts, we always want to follow uh, additional guidelines. We want to, of course, know the weight of the object, right, that we're hauling. We want to know the capacity, you know, of the handling device, right? What uh, what we're using to lift and what its ability is. And we want to ensure that handling equipment is in good working order and free of damage as well. Okay, and remember uh, examples, right, of, um, of certain motorized equipment. What are we talking about? Powered wheelbarrows, like you see at the bottom. Concrete mules, like on the next page. Industrial forklifts. Rough terrain forklifts, freight elevators are all examples of, uh, of mechanical or motorized equipment, okay? So, and then at the bottom, like I said, there's your power wheelbarrow. Has anybody seen um, those power wheelbarrows in and, and action, like when they do uh, dirt hauling or concrete breakup? I'll I tell you what, it's crazy, huh, to see it. I'm gonna see if I can, um, you know. As a matter of fact, let me let me let me look at it really quickly. Hang on one second. Let's see. I, I, I can't remember the name of the. It's the blue one, but I can't remember. Let's see. Power to wheelbarrow. It's a blue bed. I'm trying to remember the name of the little devil or something like that. Let's see. Yeah, just if anybody gets a chance, like on the next break, just just go to YouTube and check out one of the you know one of these uh, videos, okay? Like uh, powered uh, wheelbarrow, and check it out, and or powered um, uh, mud mule or anything like that, and you'll see how strong those little suckers are. I'll tell you what, um, I had a group that actually brought it to my house. A uh, person brought two of them. They took a twelve yard load. He had four employees. They had it. They had the dirt put down and spread in about forty minutes. It, it's crazy. Oh, yeah, absolutely, uh, uh, Jason. Totally saves your back, right? Absolutely. It does all the work. The only, you know, the biggest work you're doing is just scooping it into the uh, in, into the wheelbarrow. Okay, great. Okay, so let's go ahead and keep on going. Uh, I'm switching over to page 12 now. And things, right? Um, remember this. If it's a motorized piece of equipment, right, a powered wheelbarrow, a mud mule, a concrete mule, a forklift, if it's powered, we got we got to qualify our employees on how to use that piece of equipment. OK, I think that's where we miss the mark a lot of times. So just make sure just make sure that you um, that you have the employees um, adequately trained. Right. Hazard awareness trained. It's a powered industrial truck. Just keep that in mind. It'll fall under 1910. It's going to fall under two standards. Let's see. It's going to fall under 1910-178. Okay, it's going to fall under powered industrial trucks. Okay, and it's also going to fall under 1926-602. I think it's 602. Let me see. Okay, material handling equipment. Okay, so th those are the two standards that we want to make sure. Let's see. And this is going to be more for like heavy equipment, but. And then. Um, and then look what it says here on 602. The requirements applicable to the construction work paragraph are identical to those in 1910-178. So you're basically going to fall back and just defer right back to the to the forklift standard. OK, and that's for anything that's motorized. OK. Um, that way, or not just, uh, well, yeah, anything that's motorized, but it could be air, hydraulic, battery, electric, gas, uh, propane, you name it, okay? Uh, liquid, hy nitrogen, uh, liquid hydrogen. So any of those, we want to make sure that we, we follow the, the adequate standards, okay? Okay. So let's see, things we want to remember, right? Making sure that those employees are certified to operate it. And who certifies them? The employer certifies them, right? 
what does the employer certify them on or we certify them on um, three level three different uh, requirements everyone has to be knowledge trained okay or formal training they call it in the standard so let me go to let me go back to 1910 178 here's 1910 178 and let's see let's go to formal Okay, so here's your standard right here. And this is what it says. As training has a consist of a combination of formal instruction, right? Formal instruction, which is lecture, discussion, interactive computer learning, uh, videotape, or written material. And then a practical training, hands-on. So basically, we're showing them, and then they're demonstrating to us. And then third of all, they're doing an evaluation to know they work safely. If we've done all three of those, and then what happens is the employer certifies, right? And... Um, the employer will certify it. I think I sent y'all a copy of that form. If you need it again, let me know. I th at least I think I did. And this is what the employer certifying on right here. Is that the, the operator's been trained and evaluated, okay, as per the paragraph that I just sent you. All right. All right, great. So um, also uh, things that we want to do, right, we want to keep the following safety guidelines in mind whenever we're operating uh, like a power wheelbarrow or any other relative piece of equipment, avoid any type of pinch points on the dumping mechanism. We want to be sure that the dump uh, bucket is securely down at all times, right? Whenever it's not dumping, um, we want, uh, we, we don't want to move the buggy right with the bucket in the, in the dump position. So we want to keep the buggy in the, in the loaded position, not in the dump position. Whenever we're moving it, we want to shut off the engine and lock the parking brake. Uh, whenever we finish using the machine, we don't want to allow any riders. It's not made for manual use uh, for anybody to, excuse me, for anybody to ride on it. Uh, we don't want to exceed the load limits, okay, in the weight or the height. And we also want to follow procedures outlined in the safety labels of the decal. So we have to follow, right, going back to the same thing, we have to follow all, all necessary guidelines, okay? And then concrete mule, folks, there you go, right, before using any type of concrete mule, um, we have to conduct a thorough inspection of, of everything, right? tires fluids mechanical hinges the joints uh any type of throttle cables and steering mechanisms we need to make sure that all those pieces of equipment and all those accessories or all those necessities are in an adequate uh, and safe working condition right also industrial forklifts what are we talking about anytime we're working in the vicinity of a forklift we have to remember the certain guidelines right all workers have to be kept safe distance from that machine okay the perimeter, what's it known as? It's called, it's considered the work zone, right? And that area, it's where the machine may come into contact with any, with a person or any other um, piece of material or equipment. And then also, in addition to that, uh, it may wind up either rear ending or forking somebody, right? And then um, workers must also stay clear of any type of fall zone. The area includes uh, the diameter is twice the height, kind of like we talked about before, right? So if the height of the load is eight feet, we're probably going to want to stay 16 feet away from that load. Okay. So that's a lot of space, folks. So let's say, let's use something relative. Let's say the load is uh, six feet. Well, we're going to keep employees away, at least 12 feet away from that load. Okay. Um, also, we want to stay in designated walkways, right? We want to make eye contact with the operator. I tell people all the time, if you see an operator, excuse me, if you cannot see the operator, the operator probably cannot see you. Okay, and just because you can see the operator, don't assume that the operator also saw you. Okay, I tell people get a visual contact, get a check, get a thumbs up, right? You get anything, right? A nod of a head, anything to make sure that uh, that that operator confirms that they saw you. Okay, and then freight freight elevators. What are we talking about, right? We're talking about you know traditional elevators, just not as fancy, much cheaper, and um. You know, and like I said, a lot of times, sometimes it will be used for employees and materials. But once we start just shipping materials by themselves, now you now you must have to you must have to get it re-rated in order to get it qualified as a uh, in order to get it qualified as a personnel lift again. OK. And then, of course, uh, monitoring that center of gravity, make sure we respect the center of gravity. Uh, also, uh, personal safety, right, of any type of riggers or hoisting personnel. We have to depend on common sense, but we also have to keep safe distance as much as possible, right? And we also have to respect whatever the load is of the piece of equipment that we're using to lift and also what recommendations or what specifications each item or material 
tells us that we have to follow as well. Okay. Also, our personnel safety of riggers, right? Like we we're talking about, and things that we want to do on the job. We always want to read and follow the manufacturer's recommendations for any type of equipment that we're loading. Also, the recommendations provided for any type of uh, startup checks or periodic inspections. Um, we also want to determine the weight of the loads. We want to include the rigging, the hardware, um, and anything that may be attached to that load. Okay, that's going to go into those weight capacities as well. We have to know the safe working load or the SWL. Okay, of equipment and rigging, um, so we don't want to exceed that limit. We want to also examine all equipment and rigging before use. We want to discard all types of defective components. We want to immediately report defective equipment or hazardous conditions uh, to the supervisor. Um, someone in authority, you know, has to make uh, is um, issue orders, right, in order to safely proceed. We also want to stop hoisting and rigging operations whenever weather conditions present a hazard. So if we have excessive wind, right? If we have um, excessive rain or low visibility or no visibility, and then we want to stop. We also want to recognize factors. Um, moving on to page 14, folks. We also want to recognize factors that can help reduce the capacity, right? So, so you know, safe working loads, what are we talking about? It's basically it's conditions to make sure that, um, that we stay under so that we can maintain safe working conditions, right? And then um, we, have to, we have to remember that safe working loads, you know, of hoisting equipment is applicable only to uh, freely suspended loads, right? Um, and plumb hoist lines. So if you look at perfect example is um, look down and look at the center of gravity diagram down at the bottom uh, of uh, center of gravity on figure 20. Okay, that center of gravity is directly below that, that vertical line. That's what they're talking about. And then the center of gravity, look at the pipe, look at figure 21, okay? And look at figure 22, where the center of gravity is gonna be more centered, right? It's gonna be more uh, centered to, to both of those ends, okay? So that's why we obviously have to watch out for large enough flows, right? Okay. And then of course, um, you know, any type of blocking, like we talked about earlier, blocking any type of tools, equipment or pipe, um, and then um, choking. Anytime we choke, and, and the biggest thing with choke is you, you want to remember this, is that, is that the capacities of rigging are significantly reduced. Anytime we use it, um, it, it, it doubles up if we use it as a basket, and it'll get reduced by about 20% or 22% when we reduce it on, um, on a choker. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is this is what I'm talking about here, folks. So, whenever we we take a uh, a piece of equipment like this, okay, on a vertical load, that'll that'll use be, and I'm I'm gonna show you. Let me let me show you some rigging at the same time. Anybody who's not familiar, uh, we also have rigging color codes. So I'm, I'm just going to do it off of here. It's going to be a little bit easier for us, okay? Let's see. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so here we go. Let's say this yellow right here, right? You know, let's say the, the vertical right here would be 3,000 pounds. If we use a basket, since it's doubled up now like this, and it's straight verticals, right? It's not tapered back in. Now it's going to be double, so it'd be 6,000 pounds. Or, or kilograms, excuse me, not even pounds, kilos. So we've got to multiply by 2.2, right? So it's going to be 64 and then I think 12, 8, if I'm not mistaken, or something like that, okay? So um, let me see if I can find one in pounds. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make our life easier. Okay. 
Okay, this one's still in kilos again. Uh, let me see. All right, let me get, um, give me one second, folks. Let me, let me grab one of mine real quick. Okay, give me one second. Let me try to pull this up for us real quick. All right. I'll pull these all the time. I can't believe I'm not finding one tonight. Let's see. Hang on a second. Might have been in a PDF action now to think about it. Let's see. All right, last one. If not, we're gonna move on. And I'll I'll do it I'll pick it up in a break if not. Okay, I'll, I'll pick. I'll pick it up in a break. Uh, what I'll do is I'll load the one I have on the card. I'll load the one I have on the card in the picture. Okay, so sorry about that, folks. Okay, so give me one second. Let's see. Let me go ahead and go back to it now. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll come back to the color codes, folks. So during the break, I'll load it up, and so y'all can take a picture, or take a look at it. Okay, and then, um, or actually, I'll tell you what. Give me one second. We're gonna knock this out right now. Yes, it's one of those days, right? So give me one second. Um, send it to myself right now. We're going to open it. Okay. All right, can y'all see that okay, folks? That's the one I had in front of me. Okay, hang on one second. I might have lost you guys. Dude. Hang on. Okay, can, can y'all see that okay? Okay, good. Okay, so here you go, right? Sorry about the delay on that. All right, so yellow rigging, right? We'd be looking at 8,400 pounds on a vertical. Uh, this is for Biggie Crane. You're looking at 8,400. On a basket, we're doubling that number up, right? So if it's a basket hitch, we're looking at 16,800 pounds per sling. Okay, and on a choker, if you see, you notice right here, we're taking a reduction, right? So basically, if you want to know what that reduction means, all you got to do, folks, is just take 6,700, and we're going to divide it by 6,700 by, um, it comes out to like 69%, I think. So 6,700 divided by 8,400, uh, 79%, actually. I thought it was 69% for some reason. But yeah, about 79%, so 80%, okay? And that's how, um, and that's how you know. So whenever you get rigging, folks, it'll have the rigging tag on it. Um, have you all seen... Uh, for those of you that are online tonight, have you seen the rigging tags? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, good. Okay. All right, good. So I'm not going crazy then, right? All right, so here you go, right? So depending on the rigging, folks, and the setup on it, uh, here you go. Perfect example, right? So there we go, 6,400 6, pounds. All right, on a choker, there's your reduction. And then on your basket, it's always going to, or just about always going to be a double of your vertical, right? So this is double, and then the choke is your reduction, which is the weakest one, okay? All right, great. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. So, um, so and then not only that, let me show you one last thing. If you look at the pipe on figure 21, on figure 21, you see where uh, where you have the, the slings. Basically, you have uh, two slings there, right? They're being used as a choker, if you notice. But also it's in a bridle, right? And that's why they that's why they're both hooking on uh, to that shackle that's tied into the hook right there. Okay. All right, great. 
Okay. And then, so let's move on. Sorry about that. Sorry about the delay. Also, uh, using the following guidelines, right? Whenever we're choking a pipeline, a load of pipe, what do we want to do? Pipes of the same length, right? We ought to lift all the same length pipes together. Okay. Different lanes should be separate, should be uh, lifted separately. So if we're lifting 12 foot pipe, let's lift 12 foot pipe, right? If we're lifting a uh, four foot or six foot pipe, and then we'll put the four foot or six point uh, put together, right? We got to lay the pipe on blocks, right? So that the slings can wrap around it on the load. So basically it's on blocks so that way we can get underneath it more easily. Also use two choker hitch hitches, right? To lift the load. That way we're not lifting in the middle. We're going to lift one to one end and one to the other and get, and not all the way to the end, but to get into that center of gravity, right? So we can adequately balance the load. We're also going to ensure that um, the open part of the hook is facing away from the center of gravity, right? Uh, from the away from the center of the slings, okay. Um, also, we're not going to uh, use carbon steel slings, you know, on painted or stainless steel pipe because of cross contamination of the metals, right? So, what are we talking about? Basically, like galvanic action. You know, we don't want to We don't want to harm the slings for further future use, and we don't want to harm the other materials for future use as well. Okay. And so, what are we going to use? Synthetic and uh, Synthetic slings, right? And web slings like you see right now in the photo. And not only that, but why else are we doing that? Because that way we're minimizing the risk and it's less weight, right? And it's easier to inspect as well. So there's a bunch of different reasons why we're doing it. So and then we, and then um, any uh, also when we're talking about rigging pipe, right? Let's talk about uh, lifting, right? We're going to follow the certain guidelines. We're going to use a hook uh, for lifting a line of the crane. Okay, at the center line, right, to make sure to make sure that we line up that center of gravity. We're going to make sure that we check the boom angle on the crane uh, to make sure that the load's not moved forward or backward when tension's put on it, right, basically almost like side loading. So we want to make sure that we're directly, that that, that, that line of that crane, um, that the hoisting line is directly, is vertical, okay? And then that way we maintain that center of gravity. Uh, we want to stand clear of the load. Um, where the operator can clearly see the load, if possible, right? Never stand underneath the load. As soon as the load clears the ground, we want to check it uh, for orientation. We also want to make sure that it's adequately rigged at that point. That's not going to potentially slip or, or cause hazards. We also want to make sure that we handle all loads with a tag line. We want to keep loads um, as low to the ground as possible, right? And then for landing, uh, we want to follow the guidelines whenever we're going to land it, right? When we land it, what are we going to do? Store all the pipe on the level ground, right? We also want to make sure that we land the load on blocks, you know, that are long enough and thick enough, right, to support the load. We also want to stand on one side of the load and guide it into the blocks. Uh, so be, you know, be overly cautious of our of our body positioning and the footing, right? We want to ensure that the slings uh, can be removed uh, once the load's placed on the blocks. So that way the blocks are going to be high enough to where the slings can uh, more uh, freely come out, be pulled out. We have to remember that a load of pipe uh, when roll tension is released, right? So we need to make sure that, um, you know, that, that there's no uh, stored energy and that the pipe wants to roll out of place, dis, uh, dislodge or whatever or whatever the risk may be. Um, also, we want to choke the, the sides of the pipe to keep it from rolling like we talked about earlier, right? Or block it, one of the two. And we want to lay pipe side by side if at all possible. And we don't want to stack it unless we absolutely have to, Okay. And then if you look at uh, carbon steel pipe, there's your weights, folks. There's your weights on your different schedules. So, so if you look at the top, right, your, your pipe size, you know, is going down the side, and then your wall thickness or your schedule is going along the top, okay? So I'll give you a perfect example. And, and, let, me, and let me explain this, and we're about to break, folks, okay? So, um, so you have those two tables there. I'll let you look at that on the break for a few extra minutes. Um, let, me, let me explain something. Um, I had a lift once when... Um, when employees drop the load, right? And uh, they dropped a 12 inch pipe and they dropped that pipe. I'm gonna tell you how deep they locked it. They dropped it. Uh, they dropped a 12 inch pipe, about 90 feet of it, about 10 feet off the ground to the ground, okay? Well, my question, my question was how much the pipe weighed? All right, it's a 25 ton chair, uh, Mantis crane. Let me show you what that looks like. That's what I'm talking about right here, 25-ton Manus crane, something like this, right? And 
you know, I, I told them I wanted them to, uh, so that's 50,000 pounds, right, on a short stick. And they weren't on a short stick when they dropped it. They were out. They were boomed out one additional stick, okay? So um, so I told them that at 25 tons, it's 50,000 pounds on, in ideal conditions on a short stick. I told, I asked them if they were going to um, have that, that, that mantis inspected for, uh, for shock load, right, to make sure that they didn't harm the crane in any way. And they asked me why. And this is the way I looked at it. 10-foot pipe, all right, 90 feet of pipe. I don't know why they were trying to lift that much pipe and manipulate it with one with one manis. But um, they dropped it. You can see the tension on the crane when I did my response to it, when I, when I came out and inspected. And my position was this. You know, my first question to them was, how much did the pipe weigh? And how do you like this? The operator and the project manager couldn't tell me what the pipe weighed. You know, so of course, the first thing I want to know is what schedule was, right? It was schedule 80 pipe, you know, and then I wanted to know, you know, I knew the diameter was uh, 12 was uh, 12 inch pipe because it was a mixing line for an above ground storage tank. And then, um, you know, basically I called the plumber and the plumber's like, hey, it's between 80 and 100 pounds. But can you, I mean, but I mean, imagine the crane operator and the project manager are making this lift and they don't know what the piece of equipment weighs, you know, material weighs. So. You know, just to kind of give you an example, let me see if I can pull up real quick a jet mixing line, just so uh, anybody who hasn't seen it, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay, so any, for anybody who's not familiar, this is what I'm talking about, right? Here's, here's an above ground storage tank. And if you look at this tank, you see this line going all the way around right here? Well, this is, the, this is going to be the fire line on that one. Let me see if I can find one with a jet mixing line on it. And basically what it is, it's a, it's a 12 inch pipe that goes around the perimeter, about three quarters of the perimeter around the tank. And it basically just mixes uh, oil from one side to the other, uh, just basically to create, to create a jet mixing line is what it is. So let's see. It may take me a while to find these, and I think I think I have my pictures. I'll see if I can pull my pictures on it, um, probably over the weekend or, or or for Thursday to show you what it looks like. But basically, it's going to be a tube going around, twelve inch tube going around the perimeter, about three quarters of the perimeter where on the tank, and that's what that's what allows that the, the to blend. That's how they sometimes do blends in certain tanks. Okay, so anybody who's not familiar with that, so I'll, I'll see if I can get you a better picture of that. Okay, folks, so let's do this. Look, it's already 7.35. I didn't realize it was getting so late already. It's uh, 7.35. Let's do this. Is let's, take, um, let's take 15. I'm going to load up a couple things for you, okay? We are done with this book. Uh, how are you all coming along with the questions, folks, in the, um, in the green? Everybody okay with the questions in it? Okay, good. And then you had the questions in the white also, which I sent you the answer key to the ones in the white. Everybody okay with those? Okay, good. Okay, great. Did I send y'all the, um, the the answer key for the next book for the for the safety technology book? Can you tell me who got it and who hasn't gotten it? No. Okay, those are handwritten ones. Okay, I'm gonna forward those to you too. Okay, look, this is what we're gonna do, folks. Okay, I'm I'm gonna forward those to you tonight. This is what we're gonna do tonight. Is then when we come back, I'm I'm gonna get us off a little bit earlier tonight. We're gonna come back and do a little cleanup work when I come back on. And the reason being, I don't want to get into the field, into the uh, safety technology book until Thursday. That way we start on a clean slate, okay, instead of starting a new book tonight. So why don't we do this? Let's take 15 at 10 minutes till we jump back online. I'll probably have you off for about 8.30, 8.45 tonight at the latest, okay? I'm going to leave you with a few things. And then right now while we're uh, while I'm doing a couple of things, I'm going to send you the answer keys for the questions in the, um, in the safety technology book, okay? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blank up my screen and I'll see you all at uh, 10 minutes till. Thank you all. already everybody and we're back okay can you uh just check in with me let me know if you're back online okay good okay so let me tell you what we got going on all right um i emailed everyone 
the answer keys for uh, the safety technology book while we're on the break. In addition to sending you the safety technology book, in addition to sending you that book, I also went ahead and sent you the, um, the answer keys to that one. And now if you look at this, um, we're going to remember, we're going to have 27 modules. Okay. We're going to have 27 modules. Uh, those 27 modules are going to be a total of, I think I said 350 test, uh, questions originally. It's actually only 290. All right. So um, we have 25 modules at 10 questions. So that's 250 questions. We have one module at 25. That makes it 275. And then one module at 10. So actually 285 questions is the whole test. Okay. Um, in addition to that, we're doing certain performance evaluations as well. If you notice these 15 on the board, or these 15 that I have on the on the screen right now, and I'm going to cut and paste this list and email it to you as well. And we're going to be doing all these evaluations, okay? So, um, but these are actually they, they wound up being really fast, okay? Properly completing the JSA, right? Well, let me start from the beginning. You know, calculating risk using a risk formula. In uh, the next week or two, I'll send that out to everybody. Conducting a safety audit, right? We, we've got a, a a small generic audit that we use. Uh, let me ask you folks, can you uh, chime in and let me know if you have your own audit sheet already that you use for your organization? Okay, good. Okay, so a couple of you do? Okay. All right, the ones of you that do, great. The ones that you don't, um, we'll, we'll have one for you, okay? And I'll, I'll send you out a, a generic one uh, probably towards the end of next week. We'll start sending out a few of these documents, okay? So we're going to send them out via email, and then when we get here, we'll do them in person as well. And uh, make sure that we go ahead and comply with uh, with NCCR for all of these evaluations. Okay, so this is this is not this this isn't a major thing. This will probably take us a total of a couple of hours, something like that. Um, so I'll, I'll t we'll talk about testing in just a minute. Uh, conducting a safety audit, right? Performing a safety observation. Those kind of go hand in hand. Um, the that's a mirror documents basically. Um, also, how to effectively communicate with a coworker, right? Right, that's easy. I mean, that's just basically having a discussion, and we're going to be talking a little about about safety and communication, right? Just remember standard, um, you know, obviously proprietary standards like manuals, right? Owners manuals, instruction manuals, proprietary stand uh, consensus like ANSI, API, um, uh, NCCER. So we'll we'll talk about all that again. Um, also, using the risk matrix. Uh, using a risk matrix is very simple. We, we do a one to five formula. I'll show you in just a second for anybody who's not familiar. Um, <clears throat> also, modifying an existing safety plan. We've got a base safety plan. If you have yours and you have a modification that you want to do or anything, uh, we can go ahead and do that as well. Okay. And then, um, and then give me one second, folks. Let me, I'm taking a picture. Okay. I'm taking a picture so, so we can, uh, what you call it? Uh, and then um, in addition to that, also properly completing your JSA, properly completing your TSA, right? Your job safety analysis and your task safety analysis, uh, performing uh, pre-inspection as well, uh, properly completing a hot work permit. And um, that was uh, already uh, the example that we're going to use is the one that oh, I think was in module six or seven in the, um, in the field safety book. We're going to go ahead and use that module since that's the one that uh, it's pretty it's pretty basic. It's pretty detailed, but it's pretty basic at the same time. It's not overly complicated. Um, the one in the NCCR book as well. Okay. Um, also demonstrating how to use lockout tagout devices. Right. We'll just have a small lockout tagout kit. If you have your own, you can, you're welcome to bring it. But if not, we'll have it here. Uh, conducting a three to five minute safety meeting. We'll talk about topics and everything else. Something you've already previously done. Hey, we're fine with. Okay. So something that you want to put together that you maybe need to work on. Uh, whatever we need to do to work with everybody. Um, when you come into test, we'll go ahead and put something to help you put something together. Conducting an accident investigation and interview. Uh, we've got a lead a set of questions. Basically, just go through your your questions. Right. Um, you go through the questions. We just want you to kind of practice it on your own time. Um, complete an accident investigation form, right? And now we're just talking about form population and then ultimately analyzing the the, uh, the accident data to determine causes of the incident, right? Whether it's root cause or whether it's multi-causation. So all really easy to use and um, and we'll, 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 we'll work with everybody on it so we can get them up to speed. So let me, let me tell you what's on the, uh, let me tell you, I'm gonna leave that up for just one moment so you guys can look at it really quickly, okay? Okay, great. 
Okay, so so what we'll do is let, let me kind of tell you what to expect on test day, right? I know next week, like I said, I'm sorry, not next week. On Thursday, we're going to start the safety technology book on Thursday evening. Okay, we're taking it the same way from module one going through. I, I'm going to, and I'm going to tell you what I'm shooting for on Thursday, okay? I'm looking at the safety technology book right now. And we're going we're gonna to roll all the way through module one, uh, module 201 next week. And then we're going to, I'm going to try at least see if we can push through maybe module two as well. It's going to be kind of tough uh, because it is a lot of information, but we're going to see how far we can get, okay? We're, we're actually trying to keep it uh, module by module, so we're going to see, but there, there's a possibility that we get through two modules, okay? And y'all are going to see that this book is going to definitely flow a lot easier. Um, actually, just like the field safety did, because we did the safety orientation book first, okay? So, um, so test day, let me tell you what to expect. Like I said, 27 modules. We'll do a review, we'll talk, we'll do a module, we'll do a review, we'll talk, we'll do another module, we'll do a review, a mo talk, we'll do another module. Just like if we would have been in a classroom setting from Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, doing modules anyway, okay? That's number one. Second of all, the second thing we're going to do is um, we're going to be doing those assessments, these uh, performance evaluations, excuse me. Um, so I would say if you can budget for a full eight-hour day, including breaks, I think we'll be in very good shape, okay? So, uh, so just to kind of give you a heads up, right? So uh, budget for a full eight-hour day. We might finish it in six, six and a half, seven hours, but it's definitely going to be a big push day, okay? Um, not hard. We'll take a lot of breaks. We'll take lunch in there, and, um, and then that way we'll decide, okay? Um, let's see. I know we have people in different cities. Do me a favor, folks. Uh, I, we're, and I'll tell you what we're shooting for, right, is that I'm shooting to have this book finished, this module. We're going to be looking at finishing probably right around the end of March, and then uh, probably setting up to start testing probably mid to end March. Is that what is that what everybody's looking at at this time? Upon finishing this this third book, okay, good, okay, okay, good. Um, just want to make sure, like I said, there's no rush on anybody's part. I mean, we still got a lot of material to cover. Uh, we have had some people test out. We got new people coming in, and they're doing videos to catch up. But you're going to see how much of this book is going to be catch up upon the old book. Okay, so um, let's do this, folks. I don't I don't want to push anything more tonight. Because for the reason being that um, I don't want to get started on this book on, on the on the uh, safety technology book until Thursday. So let's save that for Thursday. What I'm going to do is this is over the next course of the next half hour, I'm going to start sending you some stuff right now. I'm going to send you this list of these uh, 15 performance evaluations. OK, like I said, don't sweat it. Anybody who sees it um, uh, and we have a good bit of people that aren't online tonight. So I'm going to tell them just to, you know, that we'll talk about this or for them to watch the video so that there's an explanation. Um, anybody who's missed the last couple of, uh, I was about to say episodes, excuse me, the last couple of sessions, the, um, the for the last two weeks, everything is online. Like I said, it's noted by module number. So if you want to catch up tonight, that's great. If not, if you want to save it for another day, that's cool. Let's do that and let's wind it down for tonight. That way we don't lose anybody, especially, like I said, we're probably, we're missing over half the people tonight. So, um, and then we'll reconvene on Thursday and roll out at least one module, if not two modules, in the safety technology book. All right, is everybody good with that? Okay, good. Okay, great. All right, well, look, uh, y'all hit me up if you have anything. I'm still at the office. I'll be here for about another hour. I'm going to send y'all this uh, performance evaluation now. Um, I sent y'all the answers to the second book as well. And then uh, if y'all can start doing those, and then we'll start doing some reviews, and then we're going to keep on moving forward. And, and then as we get breaks in between also, we'll be doing some reviews for the field safety book. And that way, I think it'll be making a whole lot easier on everybody uh, when it comes to test time as well. Okay. All right. Well, great. Well, y'all, thanks. Thanks for tonight. Sorry to cut it so short, but I, I think it's best before we, we get into the next book. So, okay. Y'all have a great night. If y'all need anything at all, please holler at me. Okay. Have a good night. Thank you.